Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday to everybody. Welcome to Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. I have a bunch of things to get through on the program, so let's get started right now. Okay, and it's on those charges that the jury was hung that we see the second trial. Now, we have a graphic that can help explain this because it can get a little complicated. As you see here, out of the 12 counts, the jury came back with a decision on uh, four of them. And, and here's the interesting thing. This gives you an insight into what kind of jury you had here. It was a, they, there was a danger, of course, that when you have such similar stories, perhaps they'll just find him guilty of one thing and then find him guilty of the others. You know, that's the danger of putting everything together. But if you can see very carefully, for example, if you look at the uh, Jane Doe number two with the two different counts, forcible rape and sodomy, you could have had a jury that said, well, we definitely find him guilty of forcible rape, so man, let's throw in sodomy there. No, look at that. They were hung as to that charge. And then if you go down to Jane Doe number five, you have the, them finding him guilty of lewd conduct, but not guilty of another lewd conduct incident inside of a jacuzzi. So this was a jury that was very careful looking at the facts, listening to each alleged victim listening to the stories, understanding what happened, and not making judgments. That's the kind of jury that you want that carefully evaluates the evidence and the law. Hopefully, for both sides, you get the same jury moving forward. And now we want to talk a little bit more about this case. So joining me this morning to break down everything that we're going to be covering is retired LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey. Cheryl, good morning to you. Great to have you here. Good morning, Jesse. Now, this is an interesting case, is it not? You know, we talk about people who have been accused of being sexual or serial predators. This one is very different. What are, you, what are your thoughts on this case? Well, you know, it's, it's hard for me to say because, I mean, the, the victims, I, they're all Jane Doe's, so I don't know, you know, who's who in the zoo, if you will. But I mean, the, at least one is a 59-year-old homeless woman. Are these other ladies, you know, victims that people he knew he encountered, he had some kind of a relationship with. This guy seems to be all over the place. But there is an MO here, which I find very interesting. So just to give everybody a recap, Jane Doe number one, 54 year old transient woman. You go down to Jane Doe number two, 59 year old homeless woman. You go down to uh, Jane Doe uh, number three, who is a 57 year old woman that was living in Winslow's neighborhood. I'm going to skip Jane Doe number four. Jane Doe number five, 77 year old woman that he met at, or knew at a gym. And then you go to Jane Doe number four, who's a 17 year old from 2003. Interesting dynamic here. We have a series of four victims who are relatively older in age. These uh, occurrences happened in a relatively short period of time, but then the prosecution threw in this incident from 2003. And that is interesting. That's an interesting uh, setup here because they wanted to establish, I suppose, that this was a predator who, from the beginning, but then there's this period of, of time that lapses, and then we're getting him for all this conduct over a short period of time. And similar victims. Well, you know, it does seem like, I mean, it's the victims seem similar in that they're vulnerable, right? You have very young and not very old, but you understand what I'm saying. You have a young girl, 17, and then you have um, older, more mature women, but, you know, are all in a predicament, homeless, um, vulnerable, you know, someone that maybe others may not be so quick to believe, compact, contrast that with, He's a former NFL player, right? You don't want to think the worst of our athletes and celebrities, if you will. But clearly he's a predator. Clearly he has a predisposed dis disposition. And I'm glad they got him off the street. The idea here, though, uh, that this jury, I, I, do, would you agree with what I said? I mean, this jury seemed to me to be one that really looked at those facts and really took into account what each Jane Doe had to say. There was a danger from a legal perspective when you bring all of those charges in at once that you could group it together. And if a jury says, oh, well, he clearly did that to Jane Doe number one, so he must have done that to Jane Doe number two and five. But they didn't. They looked at each one of those counts and were very specific about what he did and what did not do. And it seems to suggest they might have believed some of the accounts of certain Jane Doe's or some Jane Doe's over others. And as we enter into a new trial, what do you think the state is thinking? Because all in all, they yes, they got some guilty verdicts, but they were hung as to most of the charges. Well, the thing is, you know, what is it about the, the other charges that they were hung up on? For instance, you have him found guilty of rape, but not guilty on lewd conduct. 
how, how does that happen? Because lewd conduct in my mind means you're exposing yourself, right? So obviously you expose yourself, I guess, before you do the act. So how could you do the act well, but be found not guilty of lewd? So, it doesn't so, make so sense. if you take, so what you're saying is with Jane Doe number five, right? There were four different counts here. Uh, there was lewd conduct in the equipment room, lewd conduct in a jacuzzi, willful cruelty to an elder, battery against an elder. The, the law on each of those counts is very different, but in terms of facts, the idea of what happened in that jacuzzi just wasn't so clear as it was for a man who's exposing himself in an equipment room. That's a jury, in my opinion, that's the jury that you want, you, no matter which side you are, because they said, beyond a reasonable doubt, when the jacuzzi, there was a, a, an issue about what could really be seen, what couldn't be seen, they took that under consideration. They said beyond a reasonable doubt state, you didn't prove that. That's a, that's a great jury to have here who really considered every moment of the, every piece of this evidence. Well, if they were looking with great specificity, and it sounds like they were, then now the prosecutor knows what they need to do on the second trial to shore up those loose ends, if you will. How do you fix the things that were questionable that presented that reasonable doubt in the minds of the juries? All right. Well, we have more to talk about with this case. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll have more.